Having a great memory just makes your life easier and it's not something that you're born with, it's something that can be trained. Regardless of your age, your background, I'm 50, right? And my brain's never been sharper in terms of things that I could remember and retain and the people that I meet. So we could grow older, but in a lot of ways we could grow wiser. Jim Quick is a world-renowned brain coach, author, and speaker who has expertise in memory improvement, brain performance, and accelerated learning techniques. He's taught his learning techniques at top universities like Harvard and Caltech and works with top executives throughout the world. One third of your brain is predetermined by genetics and biology, but two thirds is in our control. And with Alzheimer's, for example, your genetics loads the gun, but it's your lifestyle that would trigger and fire it. There was a study of nuns, and these nuns were living 80, 90 and above. And the researchers wanted to find out what was the key to their longevity. And they said half of it was their faith and their gratitude, you know, emotional wellness, but the other half, they were Hi, it's Erica Kohlberg. And before we dive into today's podcast episode, I have an exciting announcement that can help you save an extra $1,000 without having to penny pinch or change your lifestyle. On Monday, I'm running my free five-day savings challenge where you'll discover simple and creative ways that you can save extra money every month. And whatever you want to do with that extra money is up to you. I'll just show you how to save it. The challenge is totally free to join. All you need to do is go to erica.com slash go. Erica is with a K and you can secure your spot. By the way, these strategies that you're going to discover can help you easily save money, whether you're a budgeting novice or a finance expert, and they're going to get better and better throughout the week. But I have to tell you, I'm so excited about this and don't want you to miss out. In November of last year, we ran a savings challenge and had over 200,000 people sign up. And on average, people saved $1,005 that month through what they learned in the challenge. That means our challengers collectively saved over $200 million. So trust me when I say you don't want to miss out on this one. And the deadline to sign up to be part of this free challenge is Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you secure your spot and get free access today. Again, that's erica.com slash go, E-R-I-K-A dot com slash go. See you inside. I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. What do you think a lot of us are doing that is really bad for our brains? So I think there's no such thing as a good brain or a bad brain. There's just a kind of a, a well-kept trained brain and, and an untrained brain. Um, there's no magic pill, but there's a process. Um, simple things that I would say that maybe get out and get in our way of having our better brain. A bad brain diet, that could do it. What you eat matters, especially for your gray matter. Mm. So we talk about some of the best brain foods, but on the opposite side, the heavy processed foods with all the additives and the chemicals and the high sugar, the glucose spikes, that could wreak havoc on your brain. Um, Our thoughts sometimes, uh, and we're all human, we all have negative thoughts, but sometimes we don't have to believe everything that we think. And some people think I'm too old or I'm not smart enough. At at events, people come to me, it's like, Jim, I have a horrible memory. And I always say, stop, if you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, you know, they're, they're yours. So I think that plays an effect. I think not moving, being sedentary throughout the day is a challenge, not just working out, doing your CrossFit or Pilates three times a week, but most of us are sitting behind screens and they say sitting is a new smoking. Mm -hmm. And research shows that as your body moves, your brain grooves. And so it's very important to be able to move throughout the day. Lack of nutrients, which would kind of go under food, but I think supplementation is important. Getting your right omega-3s, your fatty acids, there's certain nootropics that are very helpful, improving your focus, your memory. Positive peer group. So on the opposite side, I think a negative peer group could affect your brain because who you spend time with is who you become. And we have these mirror neurons in our nervous system where we're constantly imitating people around us. We're copying their same words, actions, thoughts, their character, their habits. So being around some of the kind of low-fi people that steal your energy, I think some people are batteries included, some people are batteries not included, (laughs) and they kind of like sap all your energy, Um, but they could also affect your brain. So it's not just your neurological networks, it's your your social networks. Mm -hmm. You know, are you around people that are challenging you, are kind to you, are encouraging, cheerleading for you? Um, which will help you live longer too, those, those solid relationships. Because on the other side, loneliness is a challenge, you know, for mental health. The opposite of a clean environment. So if we're in a very, I feel like our external world is a reflection of our internal world. So if there's a lot of clutter in our environment, if everything is like kind of disorganized, it takes more mental energy to keep track of these things. And I think so. I think it's important to Marie Kondo our our mind, if you will. 
Um, and then finally, I think uh, a few more things. I don't, I don't know if you're looking for just one or 10. Um, lack of sleep. You know, how's your brain functioning when you get a bad night's sleep? How's your ability to focus? How's your memory? How's your, your ability to solve problems? Um, your, your mood? So sleep is, is very important. Um, I've had a couple of traumatic brain injuries as a child, so I would say protect your brain. Some people are, your brain's very resilient, but it's very fragile at the same time. So make sure your kids are protected. They're wearing helmets. They're avoiding kind of extreme sports. Um, not learning, not challenging your brain could affect your brain. Your brain is, uh, it's an organ, but it acts more like a muscle and it's use it or lose it. But the two big declines we see in, in cognitive performance is usually when people graduate school. Mm -hmm. Because I, for some people, they associate learning to education, which is true. But then when their education stops, they feel like they're learning, they're done, right? And then when people retire, because often when people retire, they don't, you know, they're retiring their minds. And unfortunately, their bodies aren't too far behind. And then the last one I'll mention is stress. I mean, it's really the invisible supervillain, the amount of overload, the, you know, level of distraction, uh, emotional stress, financial stress, uh, relationship, physiological stress, environmental stress. Chronic stress has been shown to, to shrink the human brain, uh, puts you in fight or flight, kind of holds you hostage in your survival brain, but it keeps you away from your executive functioning, your creative thinking, your ability to plan, problem solve, and everything else. But um, yeah, those are quick uh, 10 things that I feel like um, can negatively affect our brain. I want to dig deeper into one of them to start off with. Yeah. So if you had to choose one that you want everyone to take action on today, which one is it? And then let's dig into it. Oh, goodness. I love all 10. I mean, <laughs> we know that about one third of your brain is predetermined by genetics and biology, but two thirds is in our control. And these 10 things, I think, are the 10 levers that, that move it. You know, you could do all of these things and have a bad night's sleep and that won't work, you know, it won't mm -hmm. work for you. Or you could be stressed out of your mind or you could be around a negative peer group or, um, I mean, my favorite out of them happens to be like the, the brain nutrition and, and the new learnings, like always learning. Because I think it's the through line of, of all successful individuals. They're always growing and they're always reading and studying and leveling up. Can we do brain nutrition first? Yeah, so yeah, of course. What should I be eating to help my brain? Yeah. Um, so everyone's a little bit different, just like there's a personalized medicine based on an assessment. There's also a personalized nutrition based on like a bio microbiome test or a nutrient profile blood test. Um, we created a, a brain type assessment that, that you just took. Um, but it also, everyone's biology is a little different. So not everybody reacts to different for the same foods, but I'll give as a whole what, what 10 of my favorite brain foods are. And keeping in mind, some people might be allergic to kale. <laughs> um, all right, so, and we could actually memorize them if, if we can. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fun. Because I think when, when you I, said 10, I was like, how am I going to remember all Right, 10 right, right. <laughs> Man, this is the wonderful way, because I know another thing of the, the 10 is the negative thinking that gets in the way. And some people think that they just have a horrible memory. And it's been my experience, there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's a trained memory, an untrained memory. Like we just weren't taught, there was no class in school called remembering mm -hmm. that we could have taken. Um, so I think one of the great ways of challenging a belief, a negative belief is to get yourself to do something you never thought you could do, right? And so let's memorize the 10 brain foods. Uh, just imagine uh, Erica calls you up and he just says, hey, while you're out, can you stop by the market? We're gonna have like a, a limitless brain party, cocktail party tonight. And you're like, oh, I'm driving, I can't write it down, but you use this technique, right? Okay. All right. So it's a 2,500 year old memory technique attributed to ancient Greece. There's an orator named Simonides who would use this technique to memorize his poetry and his speeches. And it's based on locations. We found that all of us, we tend to remember where things are better. Like think about it as a hunter gatherer, you need to memorize formulas and lots of numbers. You need to memorize where's the clean water and where's the enemy tribe and where's the fertile soil. So we store information uh, in places. So in this technique, we're gonna take a place that we're all familiar with, which is our body. And we're gonna go top to bottom. We're gonna name 10 places on our body. And it, this is a way of training your brain. So this is like, We'll just turn this into like a masterclass for everyone to upgrade their brain, which is your number one wealth building asset that you have. Um, so we can practice together. So uh, 10 places on our body, we'll do it together um, and say it out loud as you're listening to this. So, and you can touch that body part. So top, 
we could say number one is top, and we'll oh. just go right down the body. Two is nose. So you could get your verbal memory. You could just repeat after me, nose. And yes. then three is mouth. Oh. And then four are your ears. And five is your throat. So we're already halfway there. So number one was top, nose, mouth, ears, and throat. Number six are your shoulders. So what's number six? Say it out loud. Shoulders. Seven is your collar. Collar. Eight are your fingers. You wiggle your fingers. fingers. Nine is your belly. Belly. And 10 is your bottom. Wow. Okay, so now we did top to bottom, literally. And these are your 10 places. And just a quick note here, if you're not watching on YouTube, this is probably a helpful one to watch on YouTube. So in the show notes, if you're listening in audio right now, I'll put the link to watch the YouTube version of this video. Yeah, and I mean, you can't imagine it, just imagine it if you're listening to it on audio. And so we have 10 places in our body. Now all we do very simply is I'm gonna mention the 10 foods and you're gonna put a food in each place. It's like a filing system, a mental filing system. Cause you ever gone to the grocery store to buy one thing and you come back with like a bag full of things or two bag full of things, except for that one thing that you went to the <laughs> yeah. store for. I believe two of the most costly words in, in business are, I forgot. You know, think about the consequences. I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot that conversation. I forgot to go to that meeting. I forgot that person's name. You know, it just goes on and on. We lose time and credibility. We could lose a sale. But on the other side, when you can easily remember client information or product information, give speeches on camera or on in front of people without notes, learn languages or vocabulary, business vocabulary, you could just kind of write your own ticket. So, all right, here are the, the 10 foods. Um, so the first place was what? the top of our head, right? And I want you to imagine avocados. So that's my first brain food. Um, avocados are high in monounsaturated fat. Your brain is mostly fat. It's good for your brain. So just imagine you're eight years old and you're pretending you're using avocados as a scalp conditioner, all right? And if it makes you laugh or puts a smile on your face, then you're even more likely to remember it because there's a Chinese proverb that says, what I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I understand. What I hear, I heard the name, I forgot the name. What I saw, I remember. I saw your face, I remember your face. But what I do, going back to the power of practice, you really understand. So just practice with this. And just, if you add some emotion and make it a little exaggerated, we remember things that touch us emotionally. All right, so just imagine guacamole, hair conditioner, you got it. You don't have to like study it. You see it once, you'll remember it. The second place on our body was where? Our okay. nose. And I want you to imagine the second brain food, which are blueberries. So I like to call them brain berries. They're high in antioxidants. They're very neuroprotective. So just imagine blueberries coming out of your nose. Like what does that, and add your senses. What does that feel like? What does that, what does that smell like? Blueberries coming out of your nose. All right. The third place is where? Mouth. Our mouth. And the uh, third uh, brain food is broccoli. Parents are right. Broccoli is good for your good for you, good for your brain. It's high in something called sulforaphane, which is very good for cognitive health and performance. So imagine just broccoli stuck in your teeth. So embarrassing, right? Or maybe if you want to make it more memorable, exaggerate it. Like lots of broccoli or a big stalk of broccoli stuck in your teeth. What does that taste like? Good. And number four on your body, what body part was it? Was your yeah. ears. And then the fourth brain food is olive oil. So imagine you're cleaning your ears with olive oil. And don't just, if you're listening to it, just hear it. Just, just take a moment, a split second and see it. You won't, you won't forget it. You're cleaning your ears or you're wearing olive earrings, something to remind you of olive oil. All right, the fifth place is what on your body? Was your throat and the fifth brain food. If your diet allows eggs, the choline in eggs is a precursor to acetylcholine, which is very good for cognitive health and cognitive performance. So imagine just a big hard boiled egg stuck in your throat, something like that. It would never happen, but just, yeah, exactly. If you get a physiological response then you're definitely gonna remember it. That's number five. Six uh, part of your body are your what? Shoulders. Shoulders. And this, the six brain food are green leafy vegetables. So, the, so imagine shoulder pads made of kale and spinach. So you're just looking left and right, kale, spinach, see it, smell it, feel it, feel putting it on, good. The seventh place was your collar and the seventh brain food is salmon. 
the, the, the like wild salmon, sardines, it's high in omega-3s, your DHAs, which are kind of your essential fatty acids. So imagine a necklace made out of salmon sushi. And maybe the sushi is like 10 days old. So you'll never, though you'll definitely remember that. Your necklace, salmon sushi, to remind you of salmon as a brain food. The eighth part of your body was your fingers. And let's make the eighth brain food is turmeric. So imagine that golden powder, it's stuck in your nail bed. It's just all over your fingers. You can't wash it off. Turmeric, that golden powder all over your fingers. The active compound in turmeric is something called curcumin, which is shown to lower systemic inflammation in your body. All right, number nine was your belly. And the ninth brain food are walnuts, walnuts. And walnuts kind of look like the human brain. So imagine walnuts, you're eating walnuts out of your belly button. Like if you walked outside and saw somebody at the bus stop eating walnuts out of their belly button, you wouldn't have to study them for an hour, right? You see it once and you'll just never forget it, <laughs> right? And so walnuts coming out of your belly button. And then finally, 10 is your bottom. And the 10th brain food is dark chocolate. And I don't want to know what everyone is used, thinking about, <laughs> but dark <laughs> chocolate bottom. And it's not milk chocolate. Uh, but specifically dark chocolate. The, the flavonoids there are very good for your brain. Generally, what's good for your mood is going to be good for your mind, all right? So it takes a lot more time to describe because we're describing each food and some of the characteristics of the food and what we're doing with it. To actually memorize it, it was like a couple of seconds each, right? So imagine now you're listening to this and you make it to the market and you're walking down the aisles and you don't have a grocery list, but you have the list inside your mind because you put it, in the mental filing folders on your body. So you just see what's on top of your head and it reminds you of a certain food, you post on social media if you know all of them. Um, on top of your head, you had what, what food? Avocado. Avocados. And then out of our nose was a certain fruit. Blueberries. Blueberries. And stuck in our teeth, broccoli. broccoli and cleaning our ears, olive oil. olive oil. And in our throat, we had egg. a hard boiled egg, right? And then shoulders, we had shoulder pads made out of these kale and, kale, kale and spinach. Yeah, green leafy vegetables. Very good. Number seven is your collar. Salmon. salmon. We had the necklace of salmon sushi. On our fingers, we, we had the turmeric. And then out of our belly button, walnuts. walnuts. And then our bottom was uh, <laughs> the, the, the dark chocolate. <laughs> so the idea here is when you understand how your, your memory works, you could work your memory. And you know, to do the whole exercise, if I was a narrating, it maybe take a minute or two. But you know, it, this is the it's so amazing because if anyone's done successful at this, you know, meaning if they got more than they would thought they would have gotten, you know, maybe they got five or six or seven or eight. Some people, I imagine, you could even post on social media and tag us both could do it backwards, right? If you go to your your bottom, it reminds you of a certain food, right? You have a dark chocolate, and if you go work your way up, your belly button, you had walnuts. Your fingers was the what? Turmeric. Turmeric, right? And then your collar was yeah. salmon, and your your shoulders were, yeah. yeah. So you could go all the way up, um, forwards and backwards, but it's remarkable. You know, I just feel like having a great memory just makes your life easier. And it's again, it's not something that you're born with is something that could be trained regardless of your age or background. I mean, I'm in, I'm 50, right? And my brain's never been sharper in terms of the things that I could remember and retain and the people that I meet. And so we could grow older, but in a lot of ways we could grow wiser. And this is something I'm very passionate about because I, my grandmother passed of Alzheimer's when I was seven years old. Even our book, Limitless, we donated, we did over a million copies sold the first year or two. And we donated all the author proceeds to charity for Alzheimer's research for women um, in memory of my grandmother. Women are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's than men. Yet most of the research is done on male brains and treatments on male brains, and also building schools for girls in uh, Guata Ghana, Guatemala, Kenya, fully funded. So anyone who's purchased the book, we really appreciate the support. It, I think that you learn to earn to, to return, you know, and so that's a big, um, we're on a mission to build better, brighter brains. It seems like a no-brainer, but the less your business spends on operational costs like different systems, products, and services, the better your margins, which means more money in your pockets. But how do you cut costs, not corners, and keep your business on its A-game? 
Simple, NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one platform and one source of truth. You improve efficiency by bringing all your business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors, and you know I'm all about efficiency. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move. So do the math, see how you'll profit with NetSuite. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash Erica for all the details. That's netsuite.com slash Erica. Erica is with a K. I'll put the link in the description and thank you to NetSuite by Oracle for sponsoring this video. Why are women more likely to get Alzheimer's? So research is still coming out. Um, some people, some research suggests it's hormonal, like going uh, from going through menopause and there's a change in your hormonal profile. Um, also the anatomy of a woman's brain is a little different than a, a man's brain, um, but we're not sure. And that's why we wanted to fund this research because um, there's so many people who are struggling. It's, it's hard to explain to somebody who has family members, who hasn't had a family member go through it. It was like when I, I had my brain injury when I was five, I had a very bad fall and I had learning disabilities because of it, but in special education, like I was a slow kid, I would my migraines every day, balance issues. It took me three years longer to learn how to read. When I was nine years old, I was slowing down the class. I was being teased harshly that day by the other kids. And a teacher came to my defense. She pointed to me from the whole class and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And that, that's where that kind of limiting beliefs came because adults have to be very careful of their external words because they often become a child's internal words. So every single time I did badly in school, I would say, oh, because I have the bad, I have the broken brain. Every time I was in pick for sports, I would say, oh, because I have the broken brain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does affect our brain. We talked about that as one of the 10 things um, that can negatively impact our brain. But when I was going through those challenges, uh, my grandmother, so my parents immigrated uh, from Asia to the U.S. Uh, um, and, you know, they didn't speak the language. And li we live in the back of a laundromat that my mom worked at. But my parents had many jobs, um, worked very hard. But uh, my grandmother was my caregiver. She was, she was my superhero. She raised me. And But when I was around five, had my accident, she started calling me by my father's name or repeating something she just said 30 seconds ago. And so, you know, it really kind of molded what I do today as, as a career, um, because I think our struggles can be strengths, right? Adversity can be an advantage because it just really made me value uh, our brains. And, and, and because I feel like we lose our memories, we lose kind of like the tapestry of who we are. So yes, it's easier to remember facts, figures, formulas, but also just remembering the things that are important and dear to us. That's a real, a real treasure. And is it possible to, I assume naturally as we get older, our brain function declines. Is it possible with the 10 things that you talked about to reverse that in a, in a way? Yeah, so research says, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, again, I know this podcast is not meant to, to diagnose or treat any kind of, or, or, or you know, health or financial conditions. But yeah, these are the, I mentioned one third is predetermined by genetics and biology. They say like with Alzheimer's, for example, your genetics, loads the gun, but it's your lifestyle that would trigger and fire it, right? So it's certain things that you could have the genetics of this, but it, like of a certain condition. Um, but if, you know, the certain foods, you know, if they're not the best, most nourish, whatever you nourish flourishes, you're not getting the sleep, all these things really add up. So it's not one thing, but yes, yeah, certainly by all of reducing stress, getting better sleep, getting more movement and exercise, getting right nutrition and supplementation, being around positive, encouraging, kind people, you know, all, you know, constantly learning and reading every single day, all of that has been shown to, to stave off, you know, brain aging challenges. How can I prove it to myself? So if I say, okay, this today, I'm going to follow Jim's 10 rules mm -hmm. for the next year. How can I prove to myself that over the next year, my brain has improved? I mean, the good thing about what we do is everything's measurable. We have the largest academy, uh, online academy of accelerated learning and brain optimization. Students in every country in the world, 195 nations. We get a lot of feedback, but um, you can measure like reading speed, reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. You know, in our courses, we show people names, you know, faces, and then we train them and then we test them afterwards, right? It's really measurable. You give people a long list of 
numbers and see how many they can remember. And then after a certain amount of time, train them, you know, test them again. So, you, you know, the good thing about what we do, you could, just tra- you could measure focus, you can measure memory, you can measure reading and learning and, and, and such. Because um, in order, just like with finance, in order to be able to manage something, you have to be able to measure it, right? So we gamify it and we have like leaderboards and contests and AI gym quick bots that's, you know, has downloaded everything that, you know, all our courses. So it could they'd be there to help personalize learning. Because so I think that's part of the future of training development and the future of education. It's more personalized uh, using technology as a augment, not artificial intelligence, but more augmented intelligence, a tool to support our, you know, our human intelligence and our human performance. And then also with everything, you could also measure certain with with certain genetic markers. Also, you can measure sleep, right? You can measure your your REM, your deep sleep, with certain wearables. You can measure heart rate variability, um, and and on other metrics that would reflect your stress levels, your your real age, and and so much more. But yeah, I mean, I'm not asking everybody to do everything, mm-hmm. you know. So there's a quote in Limitless from a French philosopher that says life is the letter C between B and D, where B stands for birth and D stands for death and life C is choice. And I I love it because it's very, it's, it's, it's beautiful to me because it reminds us that these difficult times, they could distract us, these difficult times, they could diminish us, or these difficult times, they could develop us. We, we decide, right? And there's only four choices you can make to make a positive change in your life. So if you want to change something in your world, you have to change, right? We just know that. But there's only four changes we can make at a meta level. You can either stop something, start something, do less of something, or do more of something. Because the only other choice is do the same thing, which is insanity, right? Doing the same thing, expecting a different result. So you could stop smoking. You could start, you know, meditating. You could do less binge watching, you know, shows. And you could do more movement, right? This is simple things that we do. But I do believe that little by little, a little can become a lot. Just like compounding, right, in in, in finance. So like little by little, a little becomes a whole lot over time because consistency compounds. You know, I don't expect everybody to make big global changes, but even if they were to rate, we go through the 10 things and they rate themselves zero to 10, they just personally assess themselves. Okay, how's my diet this past seven days? Okay, I give it a five. You know, what about the next thing, which was your your thoughts? You know, how encouraging and 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 empowering were them on a scale of zero to ten? You know, and then how, movement, the next one. You know, how much did I not just go to the gym, but how much did I move throughout the day? And then you could go there and say, like, hey, look at the ones that are under five. Like, if your sleep is under five and your stress is under five, maybe that's where you need to put your energy and attention to. But um. Yeah, I really do believe that nice little things add up to big things. I caught you say the binge watching shows. So is it <laughs> is it okay to assume that binge watching is bad for me? <laughs> no, I binge watch a lot. Yeah, I just binge watched Bridgerton. Nice. Do you know what that is? I do. <laughs> um, I, I no, no judgment. Not everybody has equal uh, network. Not everyone has equal education. Not everyone has equal financial situation or whatever. But everybody has equal time, right? And, you know, everyone on the planet has their twenty four hours in a day. And so I would just say, you know, going back to life is C between B and D. You know, birth, death, choice. That we have the choice of of what we put our attention to. And and I think binge watching is fine if you if you do it consciously. And not as, for me, sometimes I'll do it mindlessly where I'll just do one more episode and one more episode and then it'll be two o'clock in the morning and then I'll pay the consequence the next day. So I don't, I, I binge, I watch shows and I use it though as time to rest and recover, right? It's, it's purposeful. Like you can't be going, I don't think a hundred miles an hour all the time and your brain has to disconnect to, to, to reconnect also, also as well. So I feel like, not everything, and I wouldn't say the word balance because I have a, I, the words hold meaning, right? So like when I hear the word balance, like trying to balance your work and your your personal life, professional life, for me, balance, if you look up in dictionary, it's like equal weight. It's like you're on a balanced beam and that's that's stressful to me. It feels stressful. For me, like I don't want to spend equal time working as I do working out right? As I do other things. So I don't want equal balance. I want harmony though. You know, I want kind of like a, like a symphony, like an orchestra. They, not every, not every person 
contributes the same amount of time, but it all comes together into this amazing symphony, you know, and, and work of art. And I think our life is like that, that there's a science and an art to our success, to our happiness. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm all for people like doing what they want to be able to recover and replenish, to, to get in that default network of our brain so that we could re-engage in the things that, you know, we need to focus on. But yeah, we can't be working, you know, just like you can't be working your body out all the time. You need time to rest and recover. I find that for me after work, not necessarily binge watching, but watching a TV show that doesn't have much substance is really the only way I can unwind. Because otherwise, if I work and then get ready to go to sleep, I'll like be in bed getting ready to go to sleep and just thinking about work and then coming up with a new idea and then having to go to my computer, write it down. Whereas if I'm watching the Kardashians, like there's just not much thinking going on in my brain. So it actually helps me to go to sleep. Yeah. Is that okay? Or? Yeah. I, I mean, who am I to judge how people put their time and their energy, their focus? But for me, it sounds like it's 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 nourishing for you, you know, and everybody has their activities. And I think you'd be able to just, you know, make choices on the things. My, my only thing is just be conscious of it. So like we're doing it with purpose, you know, and you, you, people don't have to be so like rigid, you know, in their life. That's certainly not me in terms of my schedule. And I like a certain level of freedom um, and enjoyment. Um, ability to do random things and just indulge in it when I want to. But that's why, you know, we work so hard so we could have that buffer of uh, experience. That's why, you, you know, people eat well or exercise. So then if they eat that cupcake, they're, they're kind of insulated for it because they've, they've had so many deposits in health or emotional deposits or financial deposits. Mm -hmm. We could take a hit. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And, and especially if it brings you joy and it, it, it does tackle one of the 10 things, which is stress reduction. If that's what helps people to reduce stress by binge watching a show, then, I mean, that sounds therapeutic to me. I think that the, the, the case comes when it's not serving us. Like, at what point is it, like, would it be too much? Like video games. Like video games have been shown to help focus, hand-eye coordination, reaction time, problem solving, team building, if you're doing things, you know, with, you know, virtually with a team. But at what point, do, you know, how many hours do we get diminishing returns in terms of, you know, that, that time invested. Mm -hmm. So I think everything in, in a harmony. So another thing on your list of 10 things to do for your brain is the new learnings, which is just continuously learning new things. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. If, if people, have, if we're connected on social media and they see me with Oprah or Elon or these individuals, people always inherently ask, how did you meet? How did you deepen a relationship? And we did it because we have the shared bond of learning and, and reading. And I think uh, anyone at at that level, like they, they grow, they're always learning every single day. Um, even I was at uh, Berkshire Hathaway and I had this unique opportunity through happenstance, not even for any other reason uh, to play bridge with, with Warren Buffett <laughs> at the mall. And it was just, it just was wild. But I had to ask him like, excuse us. And I was like, always learning. I was like, well, it was specifically, I hear that you read a lot. And he was like, yes, he reads 500 pages a day. I mean, how amazing. I mean, think about it. If somebody has decades of experience and they put it into a book and our listeners here, they could sit down and read that book in a few days. You could read, download decades of wisdom into days. I don't know any better quote unquote hack or advantage you could have in terms of saving time and learning from all you know people that are really experts at what they do. You know, listening to this podcast gives you such an incredible advantage because it's, there's this divide. It's not just those who have and those who don't have. There's a divide between those who know things and those who don't know things. And the people that know things, going back to life is the C between B and D, they can make better decisions. They can make better choices, right? And our life is, our, is the sum total of all the choices we've made. But the only way to make good choices is to have a good foundation of knowledge and wisdom, skills and abilities. And so constantly upgrading it. Our mind is the ultimate adaptation machine. And the faster you can learn, the faster you could earn. Because knowledge today is not only power, knowledge is profit, right? And so when somebody has more knowledge, they listen to this podcast, they plug into your YouTube, they read, you know, Limitless, whatever, then they can make better choices because they're better informed. And ultimately, everything's going to reflect. Everything they're being, doing, having, sharing with the world is going to be a reflection of those choices. Um, but going back to new learnings, I mean, we all have a to-do list, but do you have a to-learn list? Like actually learning more will actually help you to live longer. There was on the cover of Time Magazine, 
there was a study of nuns and these nuns were living 80, 90 and above. And the researchers wanted to find out what was the key to their long life, their longevity. And they said half of it was their faith and their gratitude, you know, emotional wellness. But the other half, they were lifelong learners. I mean, they they, they were studying every single day, having deep conversations every day. Uh, And because of it, it added years to their life, but also life to their years. The study was called Aging with Grace. What a a beautiful name for a study. So if people want to look it up, but it'll actually help you to live longer. And so your your brain grows. There's this uh, term called neuroplasticity, which some of your listeners might be familiar with. It's your brain's ability to adapt to new experiences. Literally, we could grow older, but we can make more connections and learn things, change our beliefs, change our habits, just through rewiring through our brains. You know, there's this phrase that um, neurons that fire together, they, they wire together. And the key for it is novelty and nutrition. And that's why I focus on these two out of the 10. All of them are important. It's just like if you want to build your, your, your physical muscles, you go to the gym, you give it novelty, you work it out, give it some kind of stimulus, and then you feed it proper nutrition, amino acids, fats, and so on. And uh, same thing with your mental muscles. You have to give it novelty, and then you have to give it proper nutrition to be able to grow. And the reason I focus on the brain, like if you're watching this on YouTube, um, I'm, I, I have a brain on my shirt and I always wear a brain shirt and all the photos I'm always point into my brain because I feel like what you see, you take care of. Like you see your car, you see your your clothes or your skin, it, your hair, it's in your constant attention. So you know when it's like falling below par, but we don't see the thing that takes care of us, which is our brain. And I just want to remind everyone that's listening that everyone listening, your your brain is your number one wealth building asset that you have. It's not like it was hundreds of years ago, like an agricultural age or even an industrial age where it was brute strength. Today, we're compensated for our brain strength, right? It's no longer our muscle power. Today, it's our, our mind power. And again, the faster you can learn, the faster you can learn. I think an individual's ability to learn rapidly and translate that learning into action is the ultimate competitive advantage in business and, and in life. Mm-hmm. So going back to new learnings, I just think it's a very important um, and I'm preaching the choir because if you're listening to this, you should have gotten giving yourself a 10 out of 10, you know, in terms of your rating. Um, but, you know, having a to learn list, where are you going to challenge yourself every single month to learn something new? Um, because our, again, knowledge, skills, and abilities is what equates to, you know, the other treasures in our life. Um, the reason why I'm doing this, even 30, I started teaching when I was 18, so it's um, turning 51, so about 32 years. I, um, I start, when I learned these skills from a mentor, I started, I was like, I have to help other, everyone else. Cause I got really upset that there were simple things I could have done. Imagine, and I imagine a lot of people still remember the, the grocery list, but imagine applying that towards the periodic table and everything you had been learned back in school, mm-hmm. right? It'd have been so much easier. And so I was upset that I, there were simple things I could have learned that would have made my life easier. Cause I had so much self doubt, so much, um, low self-esteem. My, I was phobic of public speaking because it took me again, three years longer to read. I never knew answers. So I never wanted the spotlight. I still get nervous on stage and on videos, but, um, and it's weird because life has a sense of humor. My two biggest challenges were public speaking and learning. And life has a sense of humor because all I do is public speak on this thing called learning. Um, but it's just a reminder to everyone that our struggles lead to strength, that with challenge comes change. I don't know one strong person that had an easy life. I just don't. Right. Sometimes uh, you know, it takes difficulty to create a demand for us to, you know, to, to grow stronger. But yeah, going back to this, I started to tutor and one of my very first students, she was a freshman in college. She read, Erica, 30 books in 30 days, not skim or scan. Uh, she was a freshman. She read 30 books in 30 days. And I wanted to find out not how. I know how. I taught her how. We teach people to read faster, remember more. I want to know why. I'm, I'm insanely curious about why some people know what to do, but they don't do what they know, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you get that a little bit like, like common sense is not often common practice. Like we all know there's certain things we should do on a regular, but why don't we do it? And I found out from her, she did it because her mother was dying of terminal cancer. Doctors gave her mom just two months, 60 days to live. And the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life, books on wellness and alternative medicine and nutrition. And uh, I wish her love prayers. Six months goes by and I get a call from this young lady and she's crying profusely. 
and it just seemed like the last forever. But when she stopped, I found out there are tears of joy that her mother not only survived, is really getting better. The doctors don't know how or why. The doctors are calling it a miracle, but her mother attributed 100% to the great advice she got from her daughter who learned it from all these books. And in that moment, I realized two things. Number one, if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. And it's a superpower we all have, regardless of our age or background, career, educational level, financial situation, gender, history, IQ. We all have these amazing powers. We just, it's not how smart you are, it's how are you smart. That's why I created that uh, a brain assessment uh, so show people how to activate more of their superpowers. But the second thing I realized, besides that knowledge, power, and learning is our superpower, is I, I realized my mission is to show people how to build better, brighter brains. You know, our mission is no brain left behind. And uh, if we could raise the, even with our podcast, we've done like 400 episodes, closing in on like 100 million downloads. And like, what if somebody listening in a village somewhere listens, they listen, learn how to be creative and they solve cancer, you know, or something, right? And our minds are that amazing. So many people out of fear, they're shrinking what's possible to fit their minds. When, what if we expanded our minds if it, fit all that's possible. What is on your learning to-do list? Yeah, so um, I have like physical stuff. I, I, I tend to do a lot of things physically because I, like mo many people who are listening, are very, their job is very cognitive, right? Mm -hmm. So I swim with sharks and I jump out of planes and uh, and that's great because my wife is very, even more adventurous than, than I am. And she makes me do like, when we're, I was speaking in Sydney and we're on the plane and she was, you know, online and she's like, we should swim with sharks. I'm like, okay, uh, that's not the first thing that I think of. <laughs> but I was like, fine, with the cage, well, I'll do that. Um, I always kind of say yes, because nothing changes if we say no, right? Say no, nothing changes. But then she sets up this out of the cage kind of swimming experience, which I will never forget. You know, it was a life-changing experience. So for me, my things are things that kind of push me. So I do a lot in martial arts, you know, uh, it's something that, uh, I want to evolve in because I feel like there's a mind-body connection, but also body-mind connection, that there's certain physical activities that have been shown to even be good for your brain, like ballroom dancing, Latin dancing, uh, um, the racket sports, like, like pickleball and tennis has been shown to be very good for your brain. So as your body moves, your brain grooves. Well, we have a one-year-old. So a lot of what's on my to-learn list right now is learning how to learn for infants. And I find it so weird, like when he was born, I was like, I'm gonna totally like brain hack this kid and <laughs> you know, get him like doing all these things. But you know what I've found is I just, I watch him and I just remember who we are. Like he's so fast, I'm learning more than I'm, I feel like I'm teaching this young human because he's like curious and he's excited and he's happy for no, no reason. And he's very playful and he's not, you know, and he's learning and he's walking and he falls, but he gets up. And, and sometimes as human beings, we make mistakes. They're like, oh, I'm never doing that again. I don't wanna look bad in front of everybody else. And on that, the first video or first podcast episode I wanted to create and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I feel like when we're born, we have this infinite limitless, if you will, potentiality. But then through, I don't know if it's schooling or media or marketing, or whatever, we like shrink down in terms of like what we think is who we are and what's possible. So a lot of stuff that I'm learning right now has to do with with um, with child development because I want to. I'm writing a book on this subject, um, and then also I'm very curious about the future of education. Um, so besides the physicality of some of the martial arts that I'm doing, um, like like JKD and and and, and Muay Thai and everything. Um, I'm also interested in the future of like, like how technology is affecting learning, like artificial AI and, and all the different platforms that are out there that can enhance. Uh, there's a whole chapter in Limitless on AI. And it's the question I wrote it, the prompting question was, how do you use AI to enhance your HI, your human intelligence? And for me, it's not artificial intelligence, it's more augmented intelligence. It's, it's like a partner, it's a tool for us to use. Um, like like all tools. So um, yeah, do you have anything in particular on your like to learn list, like things, a uh, subject or skill that you'd like to get better at or embrace or? Right now I'm quite interested in optimizing health. Mm. I think a lot of your work, a lot of Brian Johnson's work, I'm just very into becoming healthier and it seems almost a waste that I'm doing things that on a daily basis I know are detrimental to my health and my brain and everything. So yeah. 
quite interested in learning about that right now. Yeah, I think longevity and just and also just having this wellness feeling because some people could grow older but not as healthy. You know, I'm very interested in in this area, especially uh, neuronutrition. This area of nutrients that could support your cognitive well being and and performance. But if I could be supportive in this area, like we we've interviewed other, some of the top longevity experts on our podcast. Um, and I read a lot. I re- I still read a book a day. I just can't really? stop. I do. Yeah, it's one of those things where, I mean, by the way, everybody here, I, if people want to know what the number one exercise for your brain is, because they want to know like what app or whatever, um, and besides our our app, <laughs> um, what I would say is uh, is reading. You know, reading is to your mind what exercise is to your body. Going back to the new learnings again. And uh, to get through one book, a week, like most people read only two or three books a year, which I feel like is really tragic. So many people buy books and they sit on their shelf unread and it becomes shelf help, not self-help. And some <laughs> people are feeling, you know, seen and <laughs> uh, maybe even attacked by me saying that. But, you know, my, my thing is we go out there to buy a book and have every intention to be able to read it. And we run out of shelf space. But I think a lot of times we don't read it because we're just not good readers, most people. Like, think about it. Reading is a skill that you weren't born with, you were trained, but when's the last time you took a class called reading? How old were you? Six? Not like a college literature class, but like a class called reading. So our skill level is still that of a six-year-old, and but the difficulty and demand as an adult has increased tremendously. And that growing gap, this is how we learn it and read it and remember it, but the demands like this, so that growing gap, it creates a health condition going back to health and wellness, because they call it information anxiety higher blood pressure, compression of leisure time, more sleeplessness, that rumination that you talked about earlier. And um, so I'm all about upgrading our skills to be able to meet the demand. Because nowadays it feels like you're taking a sip of water out of a fire hose. Think about all the research or the the books or the emails, everything you need to do to keep up with things. Uh, Because we live in this expert economy, you know, where we're paid for the knowledge and the wisdom and the insights that we have. So yeah, upgrading those skills. And anybody can do these things. It's just in school, they teach you what to learn, but there are no classes on how to learn. There's no class called how to study or how to listen or how to focus and concentrate and how to remember, right? These, this, that's, we wanted to fill in those gaps. Because I think, again, the number one skill to master is learning how to learn. Because if you can learn how to learn, focus, concentrate, understand, read, then you can apply it towards everything. Money, management, marketing, martial arts, music, everything gets easier if you can learn how to learn well. And do you see how to learn as different from how to read quicker? Like, are these two different things that require training? So I would see the reading as a subset of how to learn. So we talk about five superpowers in Limitless to unleash, to overcome the four invisible, uh, I call them the horsemen of the mental apocalypse. But these are the things I think everyone could relate to that's affecting your productivity, your performance, your peace and and your profitability, if we're gonna get into, into money. So it's driven by technology. Number one is digital distraction. Like how do you maintain your focus and concentration in a role full of rings, pings, dings, app notifications, social media alerts? Second one is something called, this is a big one, digital deluge. That's the information overload, the information fatigue syndrome. And so that's why we teach speed reading or accelerated learning. And then there's digital dementia. And this is a term in healthcare that's really scary it's the high reliance that we have as individuals to our devices and our devices act like external memories drives for us. I mean, think about, it keeps your to-dos, it keeps your calendar, it keeps your phone number, right? Um, like, in, like how many phone numbers did you know growing up? A lot. Yeah, and how many phone numbers do you know today? Sometimes I forget my own. <laughs> And I don't want to memorize 500 phone numbers, but it should be concerning we've lost the ability to remember one phone number or a PIN number or a passcode, right? And so digital dementia is basically saying your brain's like, your memory's like a muscle, it's use it or lose it. The third one is this digital dementia. And again, no, my answer would be no. I don't want to memorize all the phone numbers in my my phone, but it should be concerning we've lost the ability to remember one if we needed to, or a pin number, a passcode, or a seed phrase, or something we just read, mm-hmm. or something we just heard. And it, the, how I could equate it to everyone that they would instantly understand, it's like physicality. Like it's, the technology is there to make your life convenient, but you don't want it to cripple you because you're so dependent on it. And then the last one is 
digital deduction. So digital distraction, um, digital deluge, which is the overwhelm, digital dementia, which is why the largest chapter in Limitless is memory improvement. And the last one is a, coin, a term I coined called digital deduction, which is similar to digital dementia, where our memories aren't getting as strong because we're relying on technology. Our thinking deduction is not getting as strong, meaning this is the first generation that they scored um, lower than the previous generation on uh, for like logic and rationality. Like meaning that, I mean, think about your phone and using GPS to get from here to there. We would have to, there's a study I quote in Limitless about a London cab drivers that they have part of their brains incredibly dense because they have to study for years all the, the streets and, and, and uh, the, the maps of, of London. Uh, and because of it, they're super, you know, strong in that area. But we don't have to do that anymore because there's a, your phone will tell you how to get from here to there. But you don't have to grow and exercise and flex your visual spatial intelligence, for example. So again, you know, I love technology. It's technology didn't create these issues; it just amplifies it a lot. Yeah. And I'm just saying that you don't want to be. We don't want to be in the future where you've seen some of these cartoons and and movies that project the future where everybody is just you know, just unhealthy mentally, physically, in other ways. They're just like hooked up with IVs to like soda and, you know, just in front of a screen 24 hours a day. And, you know, it's scary, but it's, I don't know. Okay. So you're talking about how the maps example is so relevant. Like I remember we would sit in the car and like study these maps and try to figure out how to get from point A to point B. Now I don't even have to think about it. And I'm very directionally challenged because I don't need to have a great sense of direction. How do we make sure that with all of these new technologies like AI, that doesn't happen to us where we become less reliant on our own brains and more reliant on these external brains? Yeah, going back to the power of choice, it's really what you want to put your attention to. I mean, we could totally go 100% like technology, just run everything, but then we don't get the growth or the fitness, the physical or mental fitness. And on the other side, we could be doing everything our own and and be suffering and struggling because technology can make it so much easier. For me, I always see technology is not good or bad. I just see it as a, a tool for us to use. Like probably the earliest form of technology is fire, right? And fire could cook your food or fire could burn down your home. It's just how it's utilized and applied, right? Same thing with any kind of social media tech. Like, like I, I'm very pro-technology generally. It allowed this to happen, right? And it allows everyone here to be participate. So I think technology is wonderful when it's applied like that. You know, for AI, I, use, I again, I use it to, I think the future of education is personalized learning where teachers could facilitate. And you know, my mother became a special education teacher to help me with my learning challenges. She just recently retired out of New York public school system. So I have the highest respect for teachers. They're highly, you know, capable. They're committed. They're so caring, not always compensated. I feel like um, how they should be, but going into with technology, it's like nowadays we can learn from the the top historian in the world. Everybody can, you know, because it's democratized, or the top economics, you know, mind of of, of our time. Um, so we have that access. I mean, nowadays with a phone, I mean they say we have more access to information than President Clinton did when he was in office, right? And now it's we take it for granted. Um, that being said. You know, for me, I just use technology in a way where I don't kind of, I don't want to cripple myself. I still want to do the, some work, but also I want to be intelligent about it too. Just like I don't want to memorize thousands of phone numbers, right? Just the ones, but I, but for the one, for all my family members, I know all of them, right? And, and close friends, because I bet some people listening, there's a, 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 someone you text or call every single day, but honestly, if your phone was had no battery, you wouldn't know that person's number. And so I feel like I test myself and train myself in, in certain areas to an extent where I get diminishing returns, right? Um, how, for example, in the book, I talk about AI to enhance your HI and your performance um, a number of ways. Like I mentioned neuroplasticity earlier. People could go into an AI chatbot and say, explain to me neuroplasticity as if I am nine years old. And that would give you a nice foundation for, for what it is or explain to me how it's related to like a tree, you know, and then use that as a metaphor or a simile. We have a podcast I mentioned, and I like to read physical books. If I have an expert on and they happen to be an author, I, you know, I get the book, but if for some reason it gets lost in the mail, I don't like to read digital personally 
because I spend enough, I'm not looking for another excuse to be on a screen. Audiobooks is another story. Audiobooks are really, really wonderful. You know, ours is very, has been very popular, um, but also people don't retain and understand as much as an audiobook because they're usually doing something else. Mm-hmm. They're usually driving or working out or cleaning the house or they're distracted. Um, but going back, if I don't get the book, I could go on, again, AI and say, summarize this book, to, you know, for me, right? And it could, and then you can make it a little bit easier and convenient. Uh, if I could, every process memory tool that I have in Limitless, memory palaces, mind mapping, and so on, like even what we did with the body list, you could go and you could upload a speech into AI and say, create a memory palace like Jim Quick teaches on how, like a story for me to memorize this. And it's a wonderful way to shortcut, you know, your learning, make your life a little bit easier using using technology, but still doing some of the work ourselves also as as well. Um, so I'm very hopeful with technology, but I also feel like it's a balance act, you know, where you're always making this decision. Like one of the questions I ask myself all the time is like, is this good for my brain or is this bad for my brain? And it's just ingrained. I ask myself hundreds of times a day, like it's what I'm drinking or what I'm eating or what I'm watching or who I'm spending time with or whoever, is this good for my brain or bad for my brain? And that adds like a little filter up front. So hopefully I'm making, it's putting me in the right direction, making a little bit better choices because I'm more conscious about you know, what I'm, what I'm doing. Who are the types of people where you hang out with them and afterwards you're like, is this good for my brain or bad for my brain? Oh, it was bad for my brain. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people there, again, I mentioned them batteries included, batteries not included, and they like kind of sap your energy. Um, I had this interesting uh, meal with um, Susan Kane and Simon Sinek. Um, Simon wrote, power, you know, uh, Start With Why, and Susan wrote this book on introverts called, you know, which is amazing, called Quiet. And she explained to me an introvert, to us, she said, an introvert is someone who wakes up, imagine someone waking up with five gold energy coins. And, but every time throughout the day they interact with somebody, they give up one of their coins, right? And then after their five are gone, they have to replenish and, you know, kind of, kind of rebuild. And then an extrovert is different. They wake up with no gold coins and they can't wait to interact with people to get gold coins that will give them energy and such. Um, I'm definitely more of an introvert um, I, myself or ambivert. Ambivert is like a kind of a mix. You know, somebody could be extroverted, like me on stage. It's very different, very, very, you know, like animated and playful because that's how I have to get the job done. Um, But then I have to introvert to, you know, replenish and recharge. But yeah, I think we all need people to encourage us, to to challenge us, to, you know, have our backs, you know, and also if you haven't found that person, you know, be that person for someone else. And then, you know, especially be that person for yourself. So yeah, who we spend time with is who we come. We've all heard if you're around nine broke people, be careful, you're gonna be number 10 because we have these mirror neurons we're constantly imitating people around us, thoughts, standards, character, beliefs, habits. And first you create your habits, then your habits create you. So all these are things to take in consideration. But also so there's some people that are so like, so I believe some things we can only learn through a storm. So if you're going through a storm right now, you know, my heart goes out to you, inspire people with your, with your grace and your grit. And some storms come to clear our way, right? If you look back in hindsight, you don't always see it when you're going through it. And then there's some people who create their own storms and they get upset when it's raining. <laughs> and so those are the kind of people I've like, I check and like, this person good, really good for me. And, and sometimes people could be your family members, right? And I find that, you know, the people close to you, they could be sincere, but they could be sincerely wrong, but they could have good intentions deep down. You know, they don't want you to get your hopes up when you're going after a dream or they don't want you to to outgrow them because then you'll, you know, there's some kind of separation. So I think inherently people are, generally have good intentions. Um, but my advice for somebody is you don't want to fuel your life with other people's opinions and expectations because you're going to run out of gas like real, real quick. And I wouldn't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. That's like kind of my golden rule. Oh, don't, okay. don't, don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. If you're parenting, it's really useful to know what your kid's brain type is. The lesson I've learned is it's not how smart you are. Because everyone's asking that. It's like, how smart am I? How smart are my kids? How smart is my spouse? It's not how smart you are. It's how are you smart? Mm-hmm. It's not how smart you are. It's how are you smart? And I find that one of the way areas where education is lacking is they kind of focus on one or two aspects of intelligence and uh, and there's so many different more. Like if you even if you look at, at the at least the U.S. like standardized tests like the SATs, it's just two parts. It's 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 verbal and it's mathematical. 
But what about like kinesthetic intelligence, musical intelligence, you know, the great you know, musicians, composers? What about interpersonal intelligence? People are just amazing with people or intrapersonal. People are just have such a unique understanding of self, you know, or visual spatial intelligence, the great artists and, and, and architects and, and so on, designers. So I feel like intelligence, one of the lies that we, we destroy in the first couple of chapters of the book is that a lie is a limiting idea entertained. One of the lies we tell ourselves is that genius is is born when it's been my experience genius can be built right and through through discipline and hard work and training and listen to podcasts and courses um, but your 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 intelligence or your potential is not fixed like your shoe size right that's the whole amazing thing that comes out of this understanding neuroscience neurogenesis creating new brain cells as we grow older neuroplasticity creating new connections that we could we could grow older but we could grow better in so many ways it's so interesting. I really thought I was going to walk into this with like a task list of 20 things I have to do. No, we can do I that do too. I do have that task list, but I, I feel more empowered by this knowledge. I have always said, you know, I have a bad memory. I'm bad with names. I'm bad with all of these things with my regarding my brain and my memory, but I feel quite inspired. I feel like maybe that might not be true. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, I think a big part of this conversation for everyone listening is about transcending. I mean, you look at the word transcend, not to get metaphysical, but transcend, it's ending the trance, ending this mass hypnosis, maybe through marketing and media that we're limited or not enough, or maybe it's self-hypnosis where we're saying this stuff to ourselves, like we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, you know, all those things. I think even that exercise we did with remembering foods, I think a lot of people push on social media if you remember it and tag us. Uh, I'll, I'll repost some of them and I'll gift a, a number of copies of Limitless Sign to your community as a random, as just as a thank you. But um, yeah, the words we hold for ourselves, it, they're like these spells, these incantations that sometimes... So even if you find yourself saying, I don't have a great memory, I hope after this conversation, you just realize you said it and then add a little word like yet at the end. I don't have a great memory yet. It just opens up the possibility and, and the potential. And, you know, we could redraw the borders and boundaries of really what's possible. Because I feel like we're born with the, these, this infinite possibility. And, you know, it sounds kind of cheesy, but I think everything is figure outable. I love that. Okay, I want to do a quick yeah. test for myself. So the 10 foods. Oh, yeah. If you're watching this, just pause and see which how many of the 10 foods you can remember. And I'll try to do it quickly myself. So avocado, yeah. blueberries, broccoli olive oil, egg, wow. kale, spinach, salmon, walnuts. Oh, I keep forgetting <laughs> turmeric, mm -hmm. walnuts, uh, chocolate. Yeah, you got it. 10 out of 10. Yay. That's so amazing. <laughs> 9 out of 10. I kind of missed the turmeric. But there's so, and this is what I mean. There's no such thing as a good or bad memory. It's a trained memory, an untrained memory. And we did that like an hour ago. And it's still there. So when you learn how your brain works, you could work your brain. And the same thing applies to reading faster, to, to improving your focus, to getting into flow, all of that. And when people do go to mybrainanimal.com, we will give people like a protocols and procedures based on their brain type. So you could read, like create it, like dolphins love to read by picturing what they read because they're creative visionaries, right? And so on, teaching people how to remember names and all that fun stuff. Okay, I'm quite excited about learning how to read faster because I'm, I've am i always honestly been a very slow reader. I saw the people around me, how fast they would read, and I am slow. So let me just come to a random page on Limitless. How would I read this faster? Okay. So the key, we talked about how leaders are readers and reading is an exercise for your mind. And a lot of times people read a page in a book and forget what they just read. And they'll go back and reread it and still forget what they just read. Or they'll read it so slowly. So let me, let me just dispel a couple of myths and then I'll go give you a technique okay. to go through this. So first of all, reading is a skill. It's just, we haven't upgraded that skill in some time since we were six or seven years old. Now, the challenge with, with reading is if people aren't good at it, they probably won't do it very often. And in psychology, they have something called the confidence competence loop, that the more competent you get at something, the more confident you are. And then because you're more confident, you're going to do it more often, which makes you more skilled and competent. And it's a positive loop, right? But with reading, most people don't read because they're just not, it puts them to sleep, it bores them. And so here are a couple of myths. First of all, lack of focus is a big challenge for people that read because their mind wanders. Now, I mentioned we have a lot of feedback from our students 
from every country. And we find if I tell people if they read faster, what do you think most people would say would happen to their comprehension? It would go down. down. Now, in actuality, when we test people, it's actually higher. The faster readers tend to have better comprehension. And I'll tell you why, Erica, because they have better focus. So think about this. Your brain is this incredible supercomputer. But when we read, we feed the supercomputer one word at a (laughs) time. Now, I can't even talk. I'm from New York, so I can't even talk that slowly. But if I was... If we were to talk that slowly during this conversation, what would people's minds naturally do? They would wander, they would fall asleep, they would doze off, they would think about other things. Now, aren't those the same things that happen when people read? They doze off, they think about other things, their mind wanders, they fall asleep because they're feeding their brain too slow. So let me say it in another way. It's kind of like driving a car. If you're going in your neighborhood slowly, right? You're not, have you ever like arrived and you don't even remember the trip there? Because you're not really focused on driving because you're going slow. What can you be doing? Drinking your coffee, texting, which you know you shouldn't do because multitasking is really bad for you. Um, You could be singing a song. You'd be thinking about the dry cleaning. You could do five different things when you're going slow. But if you're racing cars, you know, you're in the F1, you're you're taking hairpin turns, going as fast. Are you thinking about the dry cleaning? Are you trying to text? No. What are you focused on? Just two things, what's in front of you and, and how you're driving. And that's because the speed commands focus and the focus will give you the comprehension. Same thing with reading. If you go too slow, your mind is starving for more information. So it'll seek entertainment elsewhere in the form of distraction. But if you're reading more quickly, you're not thinking about anything else because you're satisfying your mind's need for that stimulus and that novelty. So it's not trying to think of other things. So inherently, not only are you gonna get through it faster, but because you have greater focus, the focus is gonna give you better understanding and better retention, Mm -hmm. right? And then the third thing, besides lack of, so the the big obstacles to effective reading, lack of skill, right? Last time we took a class was six years old, lack of focus, which we just addressed, that actually speed will give you focus. And then the third one is a big one called subvocalization. Now this is a term, have you ever noticed when you read, you hear that inner voice inside your head reading along with you, you hear that voice? Hopefully it's your own voice. It's not like somebody else's <laughs> voice in there. That's called subvocalization. Sub, like a submarine, under. Vocal meaning speech. It's your inner speech. So how does that relate to reading? Most people when they read, they're either saying out loud or inside the words, right? Because that's how we're taught. Now, the challenge becomes you can only read as fast as you could speak. That means your reading speed is limited to your talking speed, but not your thinking speed. A lot of people could listen to this show at 1.5 or 2X or audiobooks. They can understand it if they're trained to be able to do that, but they just can't talk that fast, right? The question becomes, do you have to say all the words in order to understand what the words mean? And the truth is you don't, mm-hmm. right? Just like the punctuation marks, you know, the, the, the exclamation mark, the question mark, the, the semicolon, the period, you don't say those things. They're symbols that have a meaning. You don't have to pronounce it. It's like when you're driving, you see a stop sign. Nobody says the word stop. You, you understand what it means, yeah. right? You don't say it to yourself. 95% of the words in that book are what they call sight words. They're words you've seen thousands of times, like a stop sign, and you don't have to pronounce it to understand it. So how it got there is when we were younger, you know, five, six, whatever, and you're learning how to read, and then the teacher said, read quietly to yourself or read silently to yourself. And that's where you took that external voice and you internalize it. You said, for me to understand it, I have to hear it. If not out here, then then in here, inside your mind. So a big part of our training, you know, in these courses that we do is teach people how to reduce subvocalization. Because most of the words in there, the and there because of, like, you don't, like, we're in, you don't say New York City to understand what New York City is, right? They're sight words. And so that's the idea. Now, how do you overcome some of these obstacles, because then the last obstacle is regression, back skipping. A lot of us have a bad habit when you're, have you ever found yourself reading something and you reread the line or something? Yeah. Yeah, a good amount of time is spent unconsciously rereading words, which doesn't help us to understand it better. We're just, just bad habit, right? So how to overcome that? If you want to read this book faster, right? And if you're watching this on YouTube, you could kind of see a visual demonstration. The first thing I'll do is test yourself. So what I would want everyone to do is put a mark in the margin where you left off, time yourself for 60 seconds, put a mark in the margin after 60 seconds, count the number of lines. 
because in order to be able to, to manage it, you got to measure it, right? So how do you know if it's going to work if you don't have a baseline? So you have a number of how many lines you read in a minute. And then the second one you want to do is you want to read, pick up where you left off, but just underline the words. You, now, I don't mean actually underlining with a marker or a highlighter, but just right above. If you're doing it on a screen, it could be your finger, or you're not touching the page or the screen. You're just going right above it, going left to right, not skipping anything. Traditional speed reading will have you go right down the page or make S forms or Z forms, but you miss big chunks. And that's why people get the gist of what they read, right? And a lot of my clients, they're medical doctors. You don't want your doctor to get the gist of what she reads, right? <laughs> that, would, that would be the goal. Or your, your attorney just to get the gist of what, what she's reading, right? So the idea is you don't skip anything. You just underline the words. And if you do that the second time, put a mark in the margin, count the number of lines, that number would be about 25, 50% lift higher than the original number using what they call visual pacer. It could be a pen, a highlighter. It could be a mouse on a computer. And the reason why is your, your eyes are attracted to motion. Well, first of all, it's interesting because now we're, we're teaching my son to read, right? And he naturally will use his finger to help him focus until later on teachers will say, don't do that, right? But actually using a finger will help you to read faster and have better focus comprehension. Second, everyone listening, you use your finger too. Nobody was using their finger when I asked you to do the first 60 seconds. But when I asked you to count the number of lines you just read, everyone goes like this, use their finger to use it as mm -hmm. a pacer, right? Because we know it helps us to focus. Third reason is our eyes are attracted to motion. So like if someone's watching this on video right now and someone ran by, you wouldn't focus on either one of us. You would focus on what moves because what moves, it's hardwired. It's like you're a hunter gatherer. You're in a bush hunting lunch, like a rabbit or carrot, whatever your diet is. And a bush next to you moves. You have to look at what moves because it's survival. Number one, that could be lunch. Or number two, you could be lunch, right? So you have to look at what moves. So when your finger is going across the page, your attention is being pulled through the information as opposed to being pulled apart. And then the last reason, because people need to know reasons to do something, um, just like even remembering names, if you want to remember names better, if you had a reason to remember their name and just checked in with that, like, why do I want to remember this person's name? Maybe to show the person respect, maybe get a referral, maybe to close a sale, maybe to practice these things, you know, I learned in this podcast, right? Without reasons, you won't get the results. So reasons reap results. So going back to the reasons, the last reason I'll say, it's how your nervous system is set up. And it's kind of interesting. Certain senses work very closely together. Like, have you ever tasted a great piece of fruit? Like, right? Not from that's been something that's sprayed and waxed in the, in the supermarket for six months, but like right off the vine or yeah. farmer's market, yeah, right? Very have you ever tasted like a great tasting peach before? So like, we can't actually taste what a peach tastes like. You're actually smelling the peach. But, uh, but your sense of smell and your sense of taste are so closely linked that your mind can't tell the difference. It can tell the difference when you're sick. If your nose is congested, what does food taste like? Wow. Bland, right? And so your sense of smell, just as your sense of smell and taste are closely linked in your nervous system, and your mind kind of melds the two, so is your sense of sight and your sense of touch. Like, it's interesting. I'll go to my son with my keys and say, look at my keys, look at my keys. And in order for him to look at it, he needs to reach out and touch it because the sense of sight and touch are closely linked like your sense of smell and your sense of taste. So when people use their finger while they read, they literally will say to me all the time saying, I feel more in touch with my reading. In fact, if somebody loses their sense of sight, how do they read? They use, they use Braille, right? Mm -hmm. Their sense of touch. And so using your finger while you read will boost your reading speed 25, 50% across the board, almost with zero practice. But because of that, it'll help you focus because you're not gonna regress and back skip, like what we were talking about before, rereading words. And because you have better focus, you're gonna have better comprehension and, and retention of the information. It's just something anybody could do. You could probably save 20 minutes on every hour doing that. And that reading takes time. Right? The average person has to read about four hours a day. You think about like your emails, your social media, your, your research, your book, whatever you're reading, media, newspapers, four hours a day. If you could just double your reading speed and save two hours a day, yeah. two hours a day over the course of a year, even one hour a day over the course of a year is 365 hours divided by a 40 hour work weeks. That's like nine work weeks you get back. Two months of productivity you get back on something ubiquitous like reading. And if you employ people, like four hours a day, that means half their day is spent reading. That means half of someone's salary is being paid to read. That's why we do like all this training at Google, Facebook, Nike, you know, SpaceX, all this kind of training, because 
you know, it, learning takes so much time. And if you can shorten that learning curve, um, we can make people more, more focused, more productive. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but today is all about Jim Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away saying, Jim Quick taught me this? Jim Quick taught me to remember who you are. I, I think when we're talking about memory, yes, facts, figures, formulas, all great. But I think the most important thing is to remember who you, who you are. And what I mean by that is you control the controllables, right? And I believe that our life is like an A, that if an A is broken by an outside force, life ends. But if it's broken by an inside force, life begins. And great things begin on the inside. And if you're listening to this, especially toward the end here, you have greatness inside of you, right? You have genius inside of you. And now is the time to, to let it out. What I mean about control the controllables you could always control. It's not about time management. It's about priority management. Him. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And so the things we can always control, I mean, have a limitless, redraw the borders and boundaries, really what's possible to be, do, have, share, what you're really meant to, to be, do, have, and share. You always control your mindset, your motivation, and the methods you're using. And so many people... Like they downgrade their dreams to meet the current situation of fear. When maybe we could set downgrade our dreams, we could upgrade our mindset, our motivation, the methods we're using to be able to meet our, you know, destiny. Yeah. I'm just so blown away by like, I, 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 I mean, listen to your show and looking at the, at some of the comments, how encouraging, you know, positive people are in your community. And I think like a trans like, so I people feel like people, if they're listening to this, that we're all on this quest to realize and reveal our, our fullest potential, whatever that might be, financially, emotionally, physically, whatever. And I think there is a version of yourself that's patiently waiting. And the goal is we show up every single day until, until we're introduced. Wow. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, this was so much fun. Yeah. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.